Hey YouTubers, good morning. Today's video is going to be a little different. I thought I'd talk about smoking. I used to smoke. I'm going to talk about how I quit smoking. This isn't going to be so much strategies on different ways people can figure out how to stop smoking. It's going to be how I stop smoking and as inspiration. But in the video description I will leave links to like the American Cancer Association other places that will have a ton of information if you're really interested in stopping smoking and the different methods and things people can use that will help and have helped people in the past to stop smoking. But to be honest, I tried most of them. <laughs> Some of them are new. Um, I stopped smoking decades ago and we didn't have vape pens and so on, things like that that you have nowadays. But we did have the patches and the gum. But uh, the method I tried, um, I don't think it's even mentioned. Uh, and it's not going to be applicable to a lot of people. But it is inspirational and it's how I stopped smoking. I guess to start from the beginning, everybody in my family smoked just about, except for my sisters. My dad smoked Swisher Sweet little cigars. My stepdad smoked. My grandmother and grandfather smoked. Um, both of my brothers smoked. Um, the people I worked with smoked. Um, but I knew it was wrong and I knew it was stupid and I never wanted to be a smoker. But in the late 70s, early 80s, I didn't have a job. I wasn't able to find work on the ships in the Mercer Marine, so I was trying to find jobs in Miami. It was one of the worst times to find work. And I hated calling people on the phone or doing job. I could, whatever job people gave me, I didn't care. I would do anything. But the actual process of getting the job was torture. I just was so petrified of picking up the phone or going for interviews. It was nerve wracking. And I found that if I smoked a cigarette, they would relax me and make me dizzy a little bit. And I didn't want to be a smoker, but I would give my brother a nickel. He would, he smoked menthol cool cigarettes, the big ones. And uh, I would give him a nickel. And I would take one before I would go on an interview or call someone on the phone. One day I told him, I said, these things are making me dizzy. He said, they're making you dizzy. I have to charge you more. <laughs> but uh, I got work. I got work at uh, a pharmaceutical company in Miami, um, right next to the river. And I continued smoking for about three years. And I tried several times to stop. And many people I work with, um, plus relationships with women I was with, they were unhappy with me smoking. And I had a lot of uh, input, <laughs> uh, motivation to not smoke. And I tried different things and nothing worked. I found when, when you do smoke, people are, they all come after you and say things they would never say to somebody else. When you smoke, once you're addicted, <laughs> It's gotcha. There's nothing nothing people can say to you or shame you or make fun of you or ridicule you or you're going to continue smoking. Um, it's you're, you're never going to get someone to stop smoking by, by chastising them or telling them bad things. Um, they knew all the bad things. Um, they have to make up their mind, but I'm getting ahead of the story. Um, like I said, I tried several times to stop smoking. And I, I, I enjoyed smoking. I would smoke those cigarettes down to the filter. I inhaled deep. Sometimes it's the tobacco it would have like a little stick of tobacco plant in there and it would burn really good. And that would be a good day. <laughs> um, like I said, I smoked those suckers down to the filter. Um, about a pack and a half a day. So I tried several times. And... Back then, they would—they actually had the cigarette machine inside the cafeteria. Um, you could smoke um, in the cafeteria. You couldn't smoke in the lab, but uh, or in the manufacturing area. But you could smoke outside all you wanted. Um, but people bring cigars to the cafeteria. Um, eventually, though, I was 
I lived on the bay um, in a really bad neighborhood. Um, and they had a, a little card reader to open the gate to let yourself into the building, into the, the parking area. And I was going inside and I dropped something in my lap while I was in my car getting ready to put the, the, the uh, little card into the card reader and I put the card in my mouth while I was doing something with both my hands and then I put it and I put it in the machine. I realized later that machine has everybody in the building puts their card into the machine and so it, it, their hands were on the card so basically everybody in the building and there was like seven buildings so there was like 300 people they just put their finger in my mouth. <laughs> so, yeah, um, I caught the flu <laughs> real quick. That weekend, uh, just like that, I felt sick and then fever and chills. and I didn't move for a day and a half in bed. And I thought to myself as I was recuperating, that day and a half was the longest I had ever been without having a cigarette. I had tried not smoking before and would last a few hours. <laughs> maybe maybe 12. Maybe 12. But you have so many triggers. When you smoke, things become associated with smoking. For me, there were strong triggers. I would have a cigarette after I ate. You need to eat. I was in my 20s whenever I had sex or thought about sex. I had a cigarette. If I had coffee, that's an addiction too. You need coffee after a while. I had a cigarette. And finally, like, if it was raining, I loved sitting out on the balcony or the porch and just drinking coffee and listening to the rain and having a cigarette. It was just like, it was, those things went together. And so you have to eat. You have to have sex. You have to, um, after a while, drink coffee if you're addicted to it. And you live in South Florida, it rains all the time. <laughs> No, I mean, it was hard to stop smoking because of the triggers and the addiction from the nicotine. But a day and a half went by with the flu, didn't move, didn't smoke. I said, I think I had maybe a couple cigarettes left in the pack, and I think I filled that pack up with water and squished it into a ball and threw it. So I knew I couldn't reconstitute that. And I proceeded. And soon enough, like three days had passed, and I hadn't had a cigarette. And I know, like, I think it's like two, between two, between two and three days, I think, is the amount of time your body needs the nicotine physiologically. After that, it's all mental. You still have the craving, the desire, but it's no longer physiological. By that, I mean, like, if you hold your breath, eventually your body needs to breathe. You know, at that's, if, if you, um, if you're hungry, you, your body needs to eat. It's something that your body needs physiologically. It's it's a, it's not just something you want it. You need it. The body needs it. But after, I think, between one and a half, two days, your body no longer needs the nicotine. Before that, it needs it because you've, you've started a chemical process, a biological process, where the body now requires that. But after a short, short period of time, it's no longer necessary. It's just mental. But sometimes those, <laughs> they can feel the same way. But I realized that it was mental after that. So I didn't want not to be in control of my mental process. I wanted to be in control. And that was something that inspired me. Because I said this was going to be something to inspire people. I was inspired by another person who worked, told me their story of not smoking anymore. He was in New York, and he was a smoker, and it was a rainstorm. It had come through like a mini hurricane, and the city was shut down, and it was cold, and it was rainy and wet, and he didn't have any cigarettes, and the stores were closed nearby, and he didn't have a car, and the buses weren't working. So he had to walk for like 35 minutes to the store, and, and, and 35 minutes back in the rain, and getting all wet just to get a cigarette. And he realized later that... He never wanted to have something that would control him, make him go out in the rain in the middle of the night. <laughs> and that's how I felt. I didn't want to have something controlling me. So I tried to keep at it. I think 
after a couple of weeks, I did break down and buy a pack because I needed one really bad. But I, I once again, after I took the one out, I filled the pack up with water and destroyed the rest of them. And that was, I think, the last cigarette I ever had. Now, many people aren't going to be able to keep away from cigarettes for three days. Uh, you would have to go someplace away from stores, away from friends, away from work. I'm thinking like if it's a three-day weekend, you could maybe go to a fish camp or go someplace where you don't know anybody, you can't bum a cigarette and there's no stores. If you could physically separate yourself away from cigarettes for just a couple of days, two or three days, and then just when you're done, realize the rest of it is all mental and just work at it from there. And I, that, otherwise, just get the flu. <laughs> but that that is a way. Also, I want to tell you, when you quit smoking, a lot of people tell you of the benefits, like obviously health benefits and how your taste and smell get better. But there's other things that get better too. One thing is your memory gets extraordinary. When I quit smoking, my memory became fantastic. I could remember every single possible place with like a mile, there could be a cigarette. <laughs> I remember waking up in the middle of the night thinking about a jacket I had wore to a wedding back when I smoked. There may still have been like a pack left with like one or two in the pockets because I only wore the jacket like once, well, wedding and funerals. Um, and or I also remember waking up or, or like just laying down and thinking and getting up. I remembered at one time I had seen in the dashboard of my car a cigarette had fallen out of the pack and rolled down in between the window of the car and the dashboard so there's like a crack or crevice and there was a cigarette down in there but you couldn't really get at it so I left it. But I'm thinking there's a cigarette. I know where one is now. So I went out there and like it's been in the sun for like like six years or something and it's just falling apart. So no, I'm not getting it. But I do remember finding ashtrays that still had the cigarette butts and taking apart the tobacco that was left in the cigarette butts. I don't think they were mine because I would smoke them down to the filter <laughs> and just rolling it up into a piece of paper or something and trying that and like because like I needed a hit. I needed another and uh, that was when I was going through the withdrawal. But the other trigger is like, because I had associated smoking with sex, my libido became like an overdrive. Because like, I no longer had the smoking, but I had the desire. And the smoking was associated with the sex. And I wasn't doing the smoking anymore, but I was thinking about the smoking all the time. And the smoking was associated with the sex. So now I'm thinking about sex all the time, like, or doing it all the time. Like, of course, I was in my 20s, but my libido had, my whole life has never been as high as it was during that, like, I would say weeks afterwards. Weeks, it was like, could be driving down the road and see a beautiful woman who would like, <laughs> now I'm thinking about the cigarette, now I'm thinking, and it was just like, oh, <laughs> it was, it was wonderful and it was terrible at the same time. Um, no one ever mentions that, but yeah, it's a, a side effect that is kind of positive um, in some ways, <laughs> but yeah. If you can find a way to separate yourself from cigarettes and the ability to get one for three days, you, your body will no longer need one. And you will just have to, to have a really strong desire um, to not ever want to have a cigarette again. Um, I think it's inspirational to listen to stories. Um, I have an advantage too, like now I've had things happen to me medically where um, I had AFib a few years ago. Um, 
if I was to start smoking, it would be bad for my heart. I don't ever want to have AFib again. So, you couldn't pay me to smoke. So, that's my story. I hope it was inspirational. I hope it was helpful. Um, I'm going to leave links to the different places that have information about the things you could try. Although I tried most of them and they didn't work for me. The only thing that worked for me was being stupid and guessing the flu <laughs> for, two, for two days. So I hope this is something helpful. Um, and if you're smoking, don't give up. Um, you only have to win one time. You know, once you quit, the longer you go from not having a cigarette, the more your body heals itself too. Once you've gone past, I think, 20 years, you have the same rates of cancer as people who have never smoked. So don't tell yourself it's too late, you, it doesn't, you're too old or whatever. It's never, it's never too old to quit smoking. And all that money that you're spending, I see, and now I'm starting to nag you like people would nag me and it never really helped. The only thing that helped was myself getting sick and being separated and then just hanging in there, riding it out till it was, it was gone. It took a while to burn out completely, but um, one last story. My brother was bipolar, manic depressive. Like 1% of people who have manic depressive bipolar issues are able to stop smoking. He was able to stop smoking. And he was one of the most impulsive persons. Like, he, he uh, if he could do it, you can too. Um, and I was always proud of him for doing that. That was extremely hard for him to do. Extremely hard. And he was able to do it. So, if, you, if you're trying to stop, <laughs> you only have to Keep trying until it works. Um, they, uh, you only have to win one time. <laughs> Guys, hope there's something helpful to you. And you're taking care of yourself in this calamity. <laughs> and it's going to get better. This too shall pass. Alright guys, take care. See you out there.